Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who brings us out of captivity into freedom, out of the wilderness into the promised land, out of death into life. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For self-centered living and for failing to walk with humility and gentleness, have mercy on us, Lord. For misuse of human relationships and for unwillingness to see the image of God in others, have mercy on us, Lord. For jealousies that divide families and nations and for rivalries that create strife and warfare, have mercy on us, Lord. For reluctance in sharing the gifts of God and for carelessness with the fruits of creation, have mercy on us, Lord. For hurtful words that condemn and for angry deeds that harm, have mercy on us, Lord. For idleness in witnessing to Jesus Christ and for squandering the gifts of love and grace, have mercy on us, Lord. Our negligence in prayer and worship and our failure to commend the faith that is in us, we confess to you, Lord. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. Through the Holy Spirit, God cleanses us and gives us the power to proclaim the mighty acts of the one who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first reading this evening comes from the second chapter of Joel. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? Here ends the reading. Joy we may again. 
retain at last. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Jesus said to them, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace and peace to you, sisters and brothers in Christ. Why do we do the things we do? Specifically for tonight, why do we Christians, why does the church do what we do during worship? Those components, those aspects, the things we do in the liturgy, week in and week out, year in and year out. Well, for the past couple of years, we've approached worship differently. I'm sure you've noticed. (laughs) We've had to consider this pandemic, which has turned out to be pretty complicated, perhaps a lot more than We might have thought as we watched the science, the data unfold in real time and circumstances changing besides and all that together meant guidance, what was helpful and expected and recommended has changed along with it. And while considering those things, we've been experiencing different levels of anxiety and stress and trauma, different for different people, of course. As for me and my part in planning and leading worship, I've had to ask questions, and answer questions for that matter, like what translates to online worship, to remote worship? Not all pastors will answer these questions the same, of course, but it's important that we each, for our own set of values and within our own theological traditions, be consistent. There should be good reasons given for why we change what we change and why we keep what we keep. So, Going online, to my mind, was a matter of considering why we do what we do, why each element of the service is there, and how it's supposed to be useful. And then take all that in mind and ask the question finally, does that work remotely? Now, I resolved originally to include absolutely everything that I felt met the criteria that it worked at all. Now, we've trimmed it down a bit since because I've added a caveat. What works well? (laughs) That's the kind of thing that needs to be reviewed every now and again. Now, in person, we made some changes too, but the criteria has been quite different. Here, it has been a matter of, you know, keeping distance or at least allowing for the possibility that those who choose to can keep their distance. It was also a matter of trimming down the length of the service, the duration, as this has been one of the most consistent bits of guidance for religious institutions. Also, especially before vaccination was widely available, we had to consider minimizing speaking and singing in unison. Even though the in-person concerns have been different, it's still a consideration to ask why we do what we do and how we can do it accommodating for time and distance and so on. Then again, what works well? 
With metrics improving, guidance laxing, and hope on the horizon, it's time to consider all these questions again. That's what we'll be doing this Lent, going over why we do what we do in worship as we inch again toward normalcy, and hopefully things are back to the way they were, at least most things, by Easter. For tonight, let's just broadly consider why we do it at all, why we worship at all. Our reading from Joel is one that's a bit hard to pin down. There's, there's two proposed dates for when it took place, which scholars tend to lean towards, and they happen to be like hundreds of years apart. If we get outside the bounds of scholarly agreement, there's even more ideas about when it may have taken place. It turns out God's people faced a lot of hardships over the centuries, and of course, we still do. And Joel's response to that is, as we just heard, sound the call to worship and everyone get to it. At the same time, we have the same reading we do each year in which Jesus commends his listeners to keep their piety private. Don't make a show of any of it, of offerings, fasting, praying, and so on. Don't do it to impress others. Now, are these two ideas in tension? Call the public together, all together, and at the same time keep piety private? No. I mean, we might say there's just a time and a place for each, but there's a through line which we must bear in mind that informs all our worship. In both cases, whether it's a response to a particular hardship for the community or on any old ordinary day between you and God, religious practice is for the people's benefit. It's for our benefit. There was once upon a time when humanity figured the divine beings up there needed us to work and to suffer for some reason. That was the general impression of Israel's neighbor. The ancient Sumerian religions usually had a focus like that, believed something like that. Worship correlated with a bunch of societal advantages. I mean, to the point we're looking back, we know that civilization as we know it could not have begun without religious practice. So the people figured that the gods and angels would only help you out if you sacrificed to them and did it just so. You know, they saw that the worship helped. They figured it's got to have some connection to why, you know, what the gods are up to. Why are things going well for us but not others? But the prophets of Israel clarified, and Jesus later reinforced, that these practices are not just about God, about what God gets out of it, about what God will do in response. Yes, they bring glory to God. Yes, they reveal to the world that our God is unique. And yes, the prophets, like Joel, give some assurance that it might move God to swoop in and help. But at the end of the day, God doesn't need anything. God desires a relationship with us, desires it, a relationship which is mutually beneficial and lays out how to make that happen. Most of the benefit of that relationship, however, (laughs) by a wide margin, is for us. It benefits us much more than it would benefit God. The church has distilled these ideas into various tools, practices, rituals, and the liturgy. So one last time, that's what we'll be looking at over the next few weeks how, through worship, we enter into relationship with God and how it's to our benefit. Lastly, for tonight, a brief reminder of why we do Ash Wednesday in particular. Jesus spent 40 days fasting in the wilderness, and as a way to remember that, we take 40 days to repent and fast. We call it the season of Lent. These are the sort of practices that make us mindful of our human frailty and our reliance on God for so much. The ashes remind us of our death and refine that focus to be on our mortality and to appropriately value the gift of eternal life promised by God, something we can't achieve on our own. In order to understand and live into the severity of the crucifixion and the resurrection, we start by being honest about who we are, our human nature, sinful and temporary, frail and weak. So tonight, at a distance, remember, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Amen.
softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he is waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Drawing close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Renew your church, O God, when we have drifted from our call to proclaim repentance and to guide your people toward justice. Lead us back to you. Encourage believers who hold the church's doors open to those who have felt excluded. Lord, in your mercy. Renew your creation, O God. Transform parched places into watered gardens and preserve each creature that awaits the arrival of spring. Turn each of us from practices of exploitation to become responsible stewards of all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy. Renew our civic life, O God. Teach those in authority to advocate for the liberation of those who are oppressed. 
Grant them courage to make difficult decisions and be with those who are in harm's way in the Ukraine. We pray peace would come swiftly. Lord, in your mercy. Renew our lives, O God. Spare your people from diseases of the body, mind, or spirit and send healing to those overcome by illness or grief. We pray especially for those who rest heavy on our hearts and minds, those on our prayer list, those who suffer in silence and in secrecy. Draw near to those who need it most. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and to each of those who struggle. Lord, in your mercy. Renew this congregation, O God, during these 40 days of Lent. Confirm our sense of mission and expand our imagination for ministry. Deepen our faith, increase our love, and draw us into your unfolding work of healing and restoration. Lord, in your mercy. As we, your church, mark ashes upon our foreheads, whether with physical ashes or in spirit, we give you praise, O God, for all the saints who died and yet are alive with you. Receive us with them into your eternal embrace. Lord, in your mercy. Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Lord, bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they may turn from their wickedness and live. Therefore, we implore God to grant us true repentance and the Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do on this day, that the rest of our life may be pure and holy and that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you, that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Go in peace, share the good news. Thanks be to God.